This is To The Point. A Rhino experience. Voted one of the top home services marketing and operations podcasts. Cutting through the bullshit and getting to the point. Hey, what is up to the point listeners? It is your boy, Chris Yano, live at the AHR Expo with my man, KG, Mr. Ken Goodrich, sometimes known as Kenny G, not that Kenny G, the CEO of Ghetto, the beast from the West. Actually, you're right here in Vegas. Right here. And all over the South, the Southwest. Hey, did you see our billboard on the casino out there for everybody? You're going to have to get really close to that thing. I said, did you see our casino out, or our, our billboard on the casino out there? For I the- did. That huge, long, tall ghetto. Just welcome to my house. Digital. Welcome, welcome to my house. You know that song, right? Yep. Hey, welcome back to the podcast again. This is what, number like six, um, five, six, seven, somewhere around there to the Kenny G Show. But hey, you've had some, you've had a big year last year on uh, multiple levels. The last time I was here, we were celebrating your 60th birthday. Yeah. Yeah, 60. I did that. That was, that was quite, that was, well, first off, that was quite an evening. Um, I didn't realize that you could lead a marching band so good. I didn't, uh, you know, I know it was quite a shock to you when you got my 60th because you can't <laughs> fathom that I, would be, that I would be that old. <laughs> That's true. With my spirit. Yeah, you look so much younger, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. with the transformation, um, you would think that maybe he was like my age, you know, 42. Well, let's don't get carried away. <laughs> but that was a fun night, a great night, a lot of celebrating. But you had some other stuff to celebrate as well. Like, what's going on with you, KG? What's up? Like, anything else that like happened recently that you might just want to, like, you know, briefly share? Like, anything that came up? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I got, you know, we got a little, we got a condo in Tahoe. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and it looks beautiful. Yeah, I saw nice. it. Yeah. I saw it. Did that. Maybe give us like a, a like a little maybe ghetto recap, like something, something big kind of happened, happened there. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. So remember I told you some time ago that uh, we had partnered, we got a, a private equity sponsor in mid 2018 and I set out our team, I pulled the team together, I said, we are going to create a 1,000 day plan. 1,000 days, and we're gonna 10X the value of this company in 1,000 days. And with that, we're gonna build a great company, we're gonna continue on the the, the get a legacy and uh, and, uh, fortify its momentum going forward, as well as have meaningful uh, wealth gains for my key people. we went out, we put the 1,000 day plan together uh, and we backed into everything that we felt what we needed from day one to day 1,000 to 10X the value of the company. What people do we need? What systems do we need? What capital do we need? What facilities do we need? Everything. And we decided when we would put those things in place and we went to work and we pulled the thing together. 1,000 day plan. 1,000 days. Now, it, now, let me back up and say, I just have this short attention span. Like I really, I can't go over three years. I can go full sprint three years and then I, I need to back off. And then full sprint, that's, what, that's my routine, right? So that's why I picked a thousand days. God. And I, I don't think, I don't know if a thousand so really So a thousand days your those. limit? <laughs> that was the limit. So anyway, we, go, we sat out on the plan, we executed, we had our challenges, we had our friction and, and things, but what I've learned over the years is if you clearly put your goals in mind, you clearly get them in mind and start to internalize how you're going to get there and, and it sets you on a course. It sets you on a course to get there. It's happened time and time again for me, but in this particular case, I'm happy to report that we did exactly what we said we were going to do. We 10 x the value of a company in actually 996 days and executed our plan. So did the last four days you just used for celebration? We did. Yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> well, congratulations again. I know I've told you this already, but it was a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal partnership you've got going on. And, and I know now you have to set a, a new plan. So, so now uh, we are now partnered with the Quartet Group uh, out of New York. And, um, uh, you know, they're, you know, I found that this PE thing, there's, you know, there's different, there's different PE firms for different size of companies and strategies and such. 
And as you continue to grow, your sponsors, you need, need to grow with you. In this particular case, we've got a sponsor we can grow with for a long, long time that has the resources, the intellectual capital, the connections and things that we can do to perpetuate, to get a legacy. And you know what our, our, our mission is, is to get a lie as a nation. Right. So that is this next phase. Like you've actually started really with the whole Southwest over into Texas. And I mean, is it kind of, are you, is the plan to still kind of start on the western half and then work your way east if an opportunity comes up are you open to going to the i mean i'm sorry from the west are you, if there's an opportunity that comes up are you open to going to the east if it's the right company that fits the plan like what's what does that look like so you know we're going to continue to march on and, and and we have our strategic plan for the next three years i haven't really identified the theme of our next plan yet and i'll next time we talk i'll get back to you so it's not it so like it was the thousand day plan so now you've got I, mean, I could keep the thousand day plan as my little thing but i also i'm you know i just always got to approve so <laughs> should it be the 999 plan <laughs> 995 i don't know yet but. i don't know but well, anyway sure so, something creative so very exciting news for us and the team we have a uh, uh, great new partners, uh, uh, big new war chest to execute our, our new plan, and I'm very excited about the future. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure how we're going to play this one. I'm kind of thinking if I could find some, you know, kind of clash of the titans, you know, where a couple of big guys maybe can pull together and make it a little easier than than trying to, you know, pull off 22 more acquisitions. Chip away, yep. yeah. So kind of poke around those th ideas. Not that you have to share this, but I just want to know, and I'm assuming you do, do you have a number in mind in your head that's like the next, where you, oh, well, thank you, Tersh. Well, thank you. Delivery service. Oh, what's up, guys? Do you have a number in mind that you're going to try and get to? Well, it, it'll involve a B. <laughs> There's I would imagine. be involved. And, and, and based on where we started, probably a couple, it has to be a couple B. I, again, I'm, I'm right, I'm just right now, I'd say I'm 70% in really defining the next plan, but it seems to me that, you know, our next step is going to be in the multi-billion dollar range is in terms of value with the company and uh, our next recapitalization is my plan. And for you, that means that's, that's what will happen. It's not an if, it's a, it's a win. As long as I keep showing up or we keep showing up, the team keeps showing, it will happen. Awesome. Well, okay. So, um, well, again, congratulations. It's been cool to um, have at least been close enough to you and seen, you know, a lot of the journey the last few years um, and having shared a lot of it on the podcast. And I know that you've heard it and you're talking about on the way here, how a couple people had stopped you about, um, you know, seeing you on the podcast or whatever, but, or listening to you on the podcast and congratulating you. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of that while you're here at the AHR Expo, uh, especially because you're home. Um, but let's just talk about this whole private equity space because uh, I know I've, anybody who's listened to the podcast know that we've had a lot of conversations around private equity with a lot of different types of players. Um, and now it's a new year. And the whole rush to get everything done in 2021 is over. It's 2022. What does this, what does this private equity space, in your opinion, look like over the next, you know, it, is it, does it stop? I don't believe it does. I think it's still got legs for the next few years, but like, what do you, I mean, you are deeper in than me. What does it look like over the next couple of years? Is it, is it as aggressive as it has been? I think we're going to get to a point where, you know, something, a new shiny thing, you know, catches the investors eyes and they start heading that way. I think uh, when, when a few of them or one of them, uh, a larger one, maybe stubs their toe a little bit or slows down that they may like lose some interest. But then there's going to be all these assets that are owned. Uh, and then at that point, I believe that somebody may uh, <laughs> say, hey, let's all put these big groups together and massage this thing out and, and you know, make it a real, a real business. Uh, and then we'll take it from there. I don't see that, uh, you know, it's not over for the independents. It's not over for the small guys. It's not even over for the uh, independent large guys. I just, you know, we're not going to see that in a long time unless there's a real disruptor, some sort of disruption that happens, much like Uber, uh, some sort of new, you know, new uh, method of air cooling that uh, uh, that is much faster 
much easier, less expensive to install. It can be subscription based, all that kind of stuff. I don't see anything other than you know, other than the blocking and tackling that goes on our industry, and maybe some financial reengineering of it. But at the end of the day, we are in skilled labor, and we got to run the skilled labor. So, you know, the obligation of the leaders of the operations is how do I make that most efficient and how do I uh, figure out how to scale that? And skilled labor scale is not easy. No, it's a beast. But you have a solution for that, though, too. We're always looking for solutions. <laughs> okay, so on this journey, um, it's not all been sunshine and roses. So you've hit a few hurdles along the way that you've had to deal with, obstacles you've had to overcome um, on this growth plan, and you've probably hit them time and time again at different levels of the business. So uh, why don't you let our listeners know, from all this Ken Goodrich knowledge that you've got, on maybe what to look out for, like maybe what not to do, whether, you know, because as you know from our listener base, uh, they are of all shapes and sizes. So what are some, like, you you know, don't do this or things to make sure that they're aware of or to look out for? Well, I, I actually think you might've got some misinformation for me. I, <laughs> I, I was raised by with a silver spoon and my yeah. dad had me into this great business and you know, everything's been easy. <laughs> so actually, yeah. And I have never done anything wrong. No, of course not. You're like an angel. That's what everybody's like. Oh, Ken Gibbard, you're such an angel. <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, I think, my wife asked me this morning, she said, why do you do these podcasts? What do you, why do you tell everybody in the industry, you know, what, what to do and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, first of all, I'm not telling them everything what to do, but I just think, I just feel like the struggle of st starting from bare bottoms in a service truck and the journey uh, that you have to take to have a real going concern in the business was so difficult and took so much and I've just watched my industry fellows struggle with it so hard I just feel like it's my duty to say hey I'm a little further down the road there's a pothole over here don't step to this don't go off that cliff watch for the coyotes over here you know I just feel like it's my duty so that's why I do this so and I'm aware yep okay so this is the new and improved far slimmer Ken Goodrich <laughs> I'm with not, the, with the beard. A, with I'm the not, beard. I'm not as angry. <laughs> That's All right, so. I would say, pa uh, well, no, passionate would be a, maybe aggressive. Let's don't say angry. Aggressive. Uh, aggressive. Whatever you want to call it. Okay, so, so. now here you are to help. So let me tell you what. Let me tell you what I wish I would have done. What I wish I would have done first before I, before I went and, and got my truck and hung up my shingle and start, started business. I wish I would have taken some time. I would, wish I would have got a job with a bigger company so I could see kind of the routines and what goes on. And I wish I would have got some leadership and management training first until I felt competent in understanding the role of a leader and the role of a manager and how to do that. Not that you have to be the best one, but you have to recognize what a good one is because you are in the people business, the skilled management, skilled labor business, and you, know how, you have to know how to do that. The work of the trade is not the business. It's the leadership and the organization of, syst uh, of processes and, s and your skilled labor, your people, and, and your seven centers of management tension that creates a business or overall business system, right? So you gotta learn how to manage people first. And you know, that's been a real struggle. There's, I've had a lot of people in the beginning of, of my career come through my doors that I didn't hang on to because I didn't know how, you know, I didn't know how to manage them. So I think it's very important that somebody gets that knowledge immediately before they start. Yeah. So it's also fair to say that not every, uh, like not everybody's like, well, here's a good, a good example. Just because you're a great player doesn't mean that you can be a good coach, right? So you also have to have, uh, man, I mean, managers and leaders, can one, can you be one or the other? Let me hear, let me tell you what I mean by that. I, it's, it's crystal clear to all of our employees at Rhino that I'm not a very good manager of people. 
And I recognize that. I don't try to be something I'm not. I'm not a good manager of people. Um, and it's mainly because some of the things I think make a good manager, I don't have. So I'm not giving them the best option for them to grow as I can by being managed by me. Now, I do manage some people. Sales is easy. Sales is numbers. It's a little bit different. I'm managing essentially their um, what they say and what they're doing. Much easier. Metrics. But to manage like a, a video production team, there's a lot of deliverables that come with that. And uh, for a guy who has ADHD, it's a little bit difficult to stay organized and manage those things efficiently. So I do have um, the ability to lead people, but it's mainly because of my passion, who I am. It's easy, so I don't have to really try. I'm just called a leader. So, but I'm not a good manager of people. Do you have both of those in your business? Somebody that's a good manager and then somebody that's a good leader? Is that different? I mean, as it gets bigger or smaller, like what, what does that look like? Well, so- Because uh, we try to yeah, make everybody yes. like be one thing. Yeah, but- I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you, know, you know, my role in the company has always been the leader and I'm a terrible manager. I'm terrible at it. I'm glad and, to hear and, that. But, but I guess <laughs> the point I'm trying to get at here is that get the education so you know what a good manager is. You got to hire them, right? And, you know, what do we do, us knuckleheads in the business? We, we, as soon as we start to get some routine going about our business, we say, let me take my best tech and make him the service manager who has no ability, has no, no track record, no training, or no understanding what management is, but he was the best one, so we put him in that role. Who was our best salesman? We make him the sales manager. So we do these goofy things that don't make any sense and that I did. Don't do that. You know, get the education, understand the difference between leadership and management. And by the way, you don't have to be the leader or the manager or the manager to own a company. Right. So one thing that you turned me on to that I ended up sending my leadership team to was maps. So you talk about education, like that's a core value of ours is you have to constantly educate. And that education doesn't always necessarily need to be on the service itself. It needs to be on the human being within the company is kind of what you're talking about is this education piece. So, and if you don't have that answer internally, there's plenty of options out there externally that you can go and take advantage of to educate yourself. So we utilized maps and I sent one of my uh, leadership teams there, Mike, who you know, and he came back with like so much information. And what was cool though from that is that we learned that a lot of things that he had learned aligned, kind of looked different, but aligned with what we did. But there was also a big chunk of things that we weren't doing and didn't know to look for to add to it that he found by sending him to a leadership team that now is being rolled down to other managers. It's weird how that works. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how it has to be, right? I mean, that's how every business, scaled business in the world has ever scaled. But remember, management, management does not come naturally, right? It's a system and they got to learn the system. You know, that's why I went to MAP originally was because I needed to have the system to teach my people on how to do it. One, because I didn't know how to do it, I wasn't very good at it. And so I utilized that resource to get my people up to speed. And you know, now we have, you know, it's just a regular part of our business now is MAP is our management training center. Yeah, they know who you are around there. Yeah, we've been (laughs) been hanging around for a little bit. (laughs) I think that when we sent Mike, there were three other people there that were referred by you and who knew us at the same time. It was pretty cool. Yeah. So I was like, well, I know he went and he's like, oh my gosh, I went here. People know who I am. They like, they know like Ken. So it was pretty neat to see like w- the influence that you've had and others are actually taking advantage of what you're saying, which is what has to happen. You got to actually take action. I, I'll say like, you know, some of my bigger branches are running 50 million or so range in, in revenue. Right. <clears throat> and People ask me, what, are, what were the key things to do to get those branches up like that? And I would say MAP. It, it was, it was I, I invested in, in my, manager, my managers to learn to be better managers. And once that happened, uh, you know, and they cascaded that, uh, those processes down, that's what grew the business. Okay. I'm going to pivot for a second. Is that okay? Yeah. So yes, we got to have management in place, constant training. I think I can't remember who's po- or who I had on the podcast that was talking about they do leadership training for all employees, whether you're in leadership or not. So um, I've not done that yet. I've certainly considered it because I think that if you like some of the core, uh, like the core things that you can learn in leadership training can be applicable across every employee, whether you're in leadership or not. But at least it gets you thinking like a leader. Um, so I've not implemented that thing yet, but how do you feel about that? I think it's a great idea. I mean, you know, 
everybody has leadership roles, whether they realize it or not, right? You, uh, you, you lead your family or, well, you don't lead your family. But <laughs> <laughs> Try. Anna leads it. But, you know, everybody has leadership roles. They find themselves, they do, I'm Jeez. just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, but seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I think that's a very important trait. And then, and, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea to, to, to uh, share the fundamentals of management. And let me tell you this quick story to get you, to get everybody thinking about this process, right? There's the management system. There was a, uh, there was a trade organization and I, uh, it, it would struggle, it struggled for a long time. And I had an opportunity to jump in and get on the board. So I got on the board and then I moved up to all the positions and I did this and this and this and that with it. But when I, when I was elected president, I just took the MAP meeting system and I implemented it in that. All I did was follow the routine that MAP teaches you on how to run the vital factors meetings. We set the vital factors, we set the meetings, we ran through the routines. I, ke I kept the meeting to one hour. So we, we did the meeting one hour, we made the assignments, we went after it, and we quadrupled the membership, we uh, 27X'd the capital in the bank, we transformed the organization, but it was because we had a management system. You get me? Yep, I think I know the organization yep. pretty well. Um, now another vital factor though is the math of the business. Should we talk about that? Should we pivot to the math? That's kind of important too, right? <laughs> you said 27X. So, yeah, the, the math. It's so interesting <laughs> to me because like, math is, I, I've always been kind of a math guy, right? So it's been easy for me. But I will say, I, I wrote about this in, in the Emoth book, with uh, HVAC book, that going to, you know, Trying to create your pricing based on what the market's saying you should charge, especially when the market is a bunch of unsophisticated mom and pop kind of businesses, is probably not the, the best way to look at it. So you have to understand the mathematics of the business. Now, I will say the next step would be you get into a best practice group, a mastermind group, and, and they'll, they'll hand you the systems, you implement the systems, they're proven, you can work. But even then, you got to know the math. So you got to know about the math behind it. Uh, here's a real life experience. I got involved years ago with um, Airtime 500, right? And they and they give you the systems. That's dating yourself. Yeah. <laughs> they, they they gave you the systems, and you know, we started implementing. We had a level of success. It worked. Then I started like digging into the math behind it. Like why, like why is it that number this way? And what if this number changed this and what would it do? And I would constantly do these scenarios with the P&L back and forth and pricing back and forth to clearly understand the cause and effect of each number in the business so that I could tweak my own model. So I didn't have to be <coughs> held hostage to the Airtime 500 model, which a lot of guys do because they don't take the time to sit down and learn the math. I can't tell you how many very, very large companies in our space are running off of systems that a best practice group taught them, which are great, they work, but the management team doesn't really understand the why behind the systems, that the math behind the systems, so that in the event something changes, they understand how to pivot, how to move, or to even to optimize the organization. Because even these systems that are trained you know, they have their, they have their walls that they're going to hit at certain sizes of businesses, scaled operations, for instance. So you got to know the math. And does that evolve too? Oh, by the way, let me throw this in. If you're not good at math, you got to, you got to become a leader and then a manager and make sure you get somebody who knows the math to lead that inside the business, right? Yeah. And if the math is wrong, then whatever the if the math is wrong no matter what you're trying to follow if the numbers are off it could be detrimental to the business so you have to have the math right and I think this is a mistake that a lot of companies make myself included is early on I used a friend to kind of help with the finances and that friend uh, sucked <laughs> 
And so I had a little cleanup to do, but it, because I was kind of moving, it wasn't a check, like a KPI, like a checker that I had in place because I was just learning business as I was in the business. Now, I think that happens often in this industry when somebody who's newer is you find the best option where you use your QuickBooks and you try to do it all. So it's as important to make sure you have the vitals, the financials within those vitals on. So take the time, learn it. If you don't know it, you can hire a part-time CFO who could do a better job. Right. You know, something. Right. You yep. got to have those on point in order to even like really use those for accountability and KPIs. Numbers got to be right. I, I can't tell you how many years that I struggled because I wanted to put accounting later, you know, and, and it, it needs to be first. You know, keeping score and, and making sure that you have your navigation tools in place are clearly number one, right? Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels, you're running around. And again, I want to reiterate this. The work is not the business. Right. So... In this plan, like I was talking about this, I can't remember which episode it was, but I did an episode on goal setting. And it was, you can set this big look. You had your thousand day plan. You have this goal. So if it's gonna be multi-billion dollar goal that you've got this year, to some people that big is, that goal is so big, you can't even understand how to get there. So you have to have these check checkpoints along the way. And the frequency I think um, can change based on what the goal is, how big the goal is. So I can, the best thing I can, do for myself having, you know, ADHD is I have to have daily goals. Like I have a daily plan that I have to follow to hit my BHAG, if you will. And then I've got like quarterly, like big rocks in place, but I've got daily plan of things that I have to do to keep myself focused. Even at your, at your guys' size, I'm assuming you have a daily plan in place. Is that right? To kind of, that you're following constantly in checkers. I mean, is it, is it that frequent? Is it not that frequent? So this is kind of a new thing for me in the last maybe couple of years, but yes, every morning I get up, I set my, you know, I, I look at my goals, I set my goals, modify them, and I go out and I, yeah, I set my plan. But the whole organization is set up that way, whereby, you know, we create an annual plan that says on, in, in January, we're gonna run, you know, 9,471 service calls and, and of this type, and this is gonna result in this, and we're gonna convert this many to that, and blah, 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 and here's where you're supposed to be on day number 22. Uh, when, you know, we've identified what day you're gonna break even, we identify how much you're gonna to put to the bottom every day after that, and what you're gonna close out the end of the month. So yeah. It's a pro forma, I mean, like, it, like it, the odds of that ending like dead nuts on is probably pretty slim, right? Like how could it possibly end like spot on on what you're, but it's a goal. It's like the closest you can get to actually saying, I got to run that amount of service calls. It's a goal, but it's, a, it's, it's an active process, right? So we're talking about it every single day. You needed six calls today. You got four. You need two more tomorrow. What are you going to do? <laughs> you know? So what should we do? <laughs> yeah, so what should we do? <laughs> got it. But that's how you can really kind of keep the close reins on like what's actually happening to goal. And I imagine that that becomes even more important if it wasn't once you add a, a partner, because clearly there's needs, you need to make sure that you're running to plan as efficiently as possible. Well, these are, you know, most of these guys, they're, they're finance guys, right? So that's, that's their world. They want to see the numbers and, and the plan and such. And, you know, the whole Wall Street thing is about, not that they're Wall Streeters, but that's their, you know, that's where they're from. The whole is, is how accurately can you predict and perform to your plan so that the investors can count on returns? That's it, right? So can they count on the return, yes or no? Even if you're too high, like even if you overshoot, that's not, it's, it's not perfect, right? It's not great. They just want, I have a plan and I execute the plan. Right? Yeah. They, want, they want reliability. That's what they're looking for. And I want reliability, too. Yeah, I would imagine you do. Yeah. Um, well, because you can't be everywhere all the time looking at all things. So you have to have reliability from them to be able to run to the metrics you have in place, whether it's the daily numbers. But the systems is the solution to all this, right? Yeah. Like we, had, we did your um, four-part episode. Uh, four-part series on the seven centers of management attention, which talks about a lot of things that you've learned and implemented successfully along the way. Now to your multi-billion dollar plan, it's the solutions 
is the is the answer. I mean, that's kind of been your jam for the longest time is kind of putting these systems in place. That's well, that's yeah. the solution. Well, yeah, because I is this mic working? It's my it's working. So it sounds different. All right. So, I mean, I struggled for a long time until I found the E Myth book and did what we're supposed to do and, and focus on it. So you know, I'm really pounding that drum all the time so that. I'm reminding myself and keeping myself heading down to that path. Uh, now, now, think about everything we talked about today. So imagine you're a, you're a guy just starting out. You got your van. You got your logo. You're all ready to go. You're excited. You got your new shirt, tech shirt, right? You're ready to go. And you listen to what, I, what we just talked about. That the business itself is not about fixing air conditioners or selling air conditioners or marketing air conditioners. It's not about that. It's about combining the seven centers as we talked about in the past, the people, the processes that they create the overall system that creates revenues and profits generated from the sale, service, and maintenance of HVAC equipment. The, s- the simple stuff. Right. See, so what do they say? Fools rush in, right? You want to start your own company, the first thing you do is not buy a van, right? <laughs> That's not the first thing you do. The second thing you do is not, and I love Dan Antonelli, but the second thing is not call him and get a logo. That's not the second thing. The first thing is, how about I get some education to understand how to run the business? I learn how to manage people or learn how to identify someone who knows how to manage people. I learn how to, the math of the business, and I really become a zealot for creating, zealot for leading my company to, to create processes and overall business system that creates the result I want. And then you do yeah, it again. Look how elegant. And again. Man, I'm getting good. At this. <laughs> it's like you figured this thing out a little bit. That's your plan to get a the nation. You take your own advice. Here's what's good, good about all this is that you, I know you um, co-wrote the Emeth HVAC contractor with Michael Lee Gerber, and basically kind of put that playbook in place for anyone to read and look at um and then but you practice what you preach you you know obviously like you do your own like you follow your own systems and all it does is your systems continue to scale as the company scales so most of the time most of the time i take my own advice you most of the time you take your own advice well that's good it would be kind of weird though if you didn't take your own advice i know but you know you know how life is (laughs) right it's life but you know what? I just did the uh, best of 2021 um, like mashup podcast. I think it was a couple of podcasts ago. And I told you this, man, like as incredibly successful as you've been and you've been with Gettle, um, something that I thought was really great about you over this past year was the change that happened with you, the transformation that happened with you, not just physically, but even emotionally. And I think what happened is, is that I started to see this version of, of KG that I actually knew exists because I've gotten close to you. And I really wanted everybody else to see the same thing, that you do like really care. You do want to see people succeed. Like, yes, you have your goals and you're driven, and, but you do have this heart to help. You just did it in your own way. Well, now you've kind of opened that thing up and this transformation was more than just your physical transformation. It was the emotional transformation. So I will urge all the listeners, um, you know, one thing that Ken said in that particular episode, the best of episode was how maybe you might have grown so much at certain times, but the, the downside to that was is the time away from family that you can't get back. Right. You know, and I saw that, you know, you and, uh, you and Duncan and um, I think some buddies were over at Bear Jackson this weekend, and, <clears throat> which, by the way, um, really wanted to go to, didn't get to go this year. Amazing if you've never checked it out, pretty awesome. So it's a lot of cool cars, but you get to have that year of, you know, that moment with him, you know, every year. And you guys got your place in Tahoe and you're kind of making up for, I think, maybe some of those lost times now, which is great. Um, we got to meet Duncan, c- cool kid, man. I don't know, he's not even a kid, you know, but you kind of missed out on some of those things. And you know me, well, I'm like, I, the reason I didn't fly in last night is I wasn't going to miss the time, you know, t- I've heard enough advice to not miss out on those things. I can't get back while my kids are young. So I flew in this morning. Even with that, now you go down this next path to your multi-billion dollar, um, you know, get a in the nation plan. I'll bet since we're in Vegas, 
I'll bet on orange. <clears throat> now, I'm going to bet that you're going to continue to put you to lean on these systems that you have in place and the management you have in place and the leadership you have in place, but not take that kind of time away from the family. No, and like you said, I mean, I, I you know, regretfully, I have to agree with you. Yeah, I'm, I got some making up to do. I would say, you know, I've seen guys who completely just divorce their families in 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 the hunt for their fortune. Um, I don't think I did that. I mean, I didn't do that. But what I was trying to say is, even the little bit that I did sacrifice, and given the reward that I have from it, it ain't worth it. You know, I would have rather had the time with the kids and the relationship with, with the family and life, and, and continue to do that. And not that I still have it. And yeah, we've uh, we've enjoyed a great family life. Of course, but uh, you know, I'm, I just want to send the message to everybody: be careful about that. That's something that you don't want to wake up one day and you're 66, and you have I don't know, 200 million dollars and nobody to do a thing with, <laughs> and you got no friends or family, and you're just sitting down looking at yourself. Kind of yeah. sucks. Yeah. So what we're talking about is work-life balance. Right. Um, and it's extremely important and you can do it. And you know, what's nice is that technology changes the game from like back, like when you're kind of growing this thing early on because you're significantly older than me. <laughs> it's just could, different. Hey, you know, I could be your dad. <laughs> uh, that's not even, no, we're not even going to go. <laughs> not even get that, that sounded creepy. That, it was weird. Hey, scrap, hey, hey, cut that well, out. Let's go ahead and cut that from the uh, <laughs> podcast. Ken is not going to be my daddy. Okay. <laughs> Got weird. Um, yeah, so we're talking about work-life balance, and, and it's extremely important, no matter how much you're going to business, to figure those things out. And sometimes that means you got to give up something that might be beneficial to your business because you don't want to miss a championship game or something that your kid's doing or a fair or a dance or whatever it is, daddy-daughter dances, mother-son, whatever it is. Um, so you got to have that along the way, and that's got to be a system I think that you also include is that how do I make sure that while I'm running the plan that I... I, if, if, if you're a systems guy, you can work that right into your system. Like, I have to be very mindful, and thankfully I use my phone, and I have everything in my calendar for things I have to do. Even if that's a follow-up phone call to say, I know my daughter had a soccer game before, I need to check in with her. It's just not that I don't, I don't care, I just will forget because my brain is on something else, I have to have a reminder. So you almost have to put create a system for that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I... You better add a chapter. I, I don't want you to, to you know... The plan is, the plan is, can be in flux. I mean, the plan can change. You can change your plan. So I see people sometimes they get so myopic that they, they just put themselves in this box with a plan. The plan can change and can adjust and flow to, uh, to accommodate all the other areas of your life. But yes, you're right. It has to include the plan. Let's go back to what we really originally started with this thing. There's a lot. There's a lot of trouble and time and anguish and cost and all the tough parts about trying to be in business that you can, you can uh, stay away from if you just get educated first. Just get educated first before you go out and start doing it. And I'm not saying you gotta go get a master's degree. There's these best practice groups are great and I think everybody should be in a best practice group mastermind group you know, uh, everybody should be in one of those because the, the connections and the and the tools and the resources are invaluable to, to build a business um, so I'm just saying don't most guys spin their wheels for 15 20 years before they get it figured out try to cut that down to two yeah so you well, really the kind of core is you keep coming back to education so whether you have the skill set or not, you have to get educated. And if it's not you, somebody who's in management or leadership in the company needs to continuously be educated on the weakest point of the business or the weakest points of the business. To well, and, and then let me, let me jump in on that. Think of it this way. Stand back and this business is your creation, right? And you figured out from these podcasts or this reading that you need these positions and need these people, you need this and that's your chess game and you're playing it all out. And you don't have to be one of the players either. You can be the architect of this business. That's good, yep. Yeah, you'd be the architect and say, I need these people, I need these resources, I need this cash, I need these partners, I need this stuff. And you just go put it all together, have the management team run the business, 
Have the investors put the capital in? Have the accounting system pay the bills and give you returns? You know, yes, that can happen. So do you ever, I mean, what is it, what does it, your day look like, or I should say maybe say a week look like now? I mean, is it much different? I mean, what does a day in the life of Ken Goodrich look like today? So I got a morning check-in with a, uh, a couple key people, you know, just a quick check-in. And then I have some routine meetings that, you know, throughout the week that we typically do, uh, you know, make sure we're heading the right direction. We have two uh, uh, branch calls a week that we go over the metrics and we share some best practices. And while I don't, while I don't feel really need to be on those calls, I like to be on the calls because I like to hear what's going on uh, and the struggles. Because another thing that I do, my, my next piece of the job is, is I'm the innovator, right? I, I okay, how are we gonna do things different? How are we gonna add a new secret sauce into this business? How am I gonna deconstruct the model and make it twice as efficient and, and five times more profitable? You know, that's yep. the stuff I'm working on. So. Um, I'll have those routine meetings to keep everybody down the line. I'm always talking to talent, and I'm innovating. So I'm going to change it up just a little bit. You and I have had some conversations about um, potential other industries. And you know that um, I've been going down this roofing path mainly because, you know, some of our friends in the industry that are kind of in the same space as you are buying roofing companies and rolling them into their organization. I don't know if it's for diversification or whatever it is, but is that a thing? Like, are you hearing more of that kind of in your world that's happening? I know that you and I have had conversations about it. I've gotten involved in it, but it does seem to work, especially if you've got rooftop units and you... I'm like, you're already up there. It could work, and the skilled labor is significantly different. So we're not running into this issue of, is there enough tech? You can make them. If you just applied the Gettle model to it and had your own reliable crew, it doesn't take the same to teach a guy to roof that it does teach him how to fix their uh, air conditioner or a furnace. Yeah. Well, I mean, hey, it, roofing is not a. I mean, roofing is a, a skill. It's a trade. It's I understand not, that, you know, right? Not every moron. I'm one, not every guy can do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think that's. I think roofing is potentially a lot more scalable uh, than, than HVAC. Um, I'm just trying know. to think from like a big picture. I mean, is it that far off? Like the thing I've struggled with that I've had the conversation with my team and some of those guys are here, is. You know, I tried to br- do a couple of podcasts because, you know, I went to RoofCon last year and gave a keynote you know, presentation. We podcasted live there. I just don't think the HVAC, you know, HVAC plumbing electrical, which is like 95% of my company, um, can see that picture of how roofing fits into that just yet. I think it's super early. However, if enough of the big private equity players are starting to realize it, typically there's a trend that's going to come from that. So that's why I'm wondering, does this thing have wheels? Does it not have wheels from the, from the partnership perspective? And by the way, like, and this is kind of a, a two-parter. I think we got to change the narrative on private equity a little bit from the, um, I'm selling my business to, I'm partnering. I think some try to do that like positively because really what you're trying to do is you, you say you recapitalize the business to scale it and, and, and grow it. That is what it is. Like, yeah, like if, if, if we were like, so I went to college. I went to college and I didn't, didn't do anything they taught me to start a business. But <laughs> you know, I went to college and they said, well, the first thing you do is you, you make your business plan and then you decide how much capital you need and then you go raise the capital. You go to banks or investors and blah, blah, blah. Well, we never do that part. And so we beat our heads against the wall for years to, you know, to try to uh, get some capital. <laughs> right. I don't know why we do this, but well, we don't know how to raise capital. But... If you went in and did it right, you came in, here's my plan, and I raised the capital, and I went out with a war chest, and I got educated, and you really did it right, your, your chances of success are infinitely better, and you're going to have a more quality organization. I don't know if that's what you asked. Well, and you, have, and you have, I think, some now some plug-and-play new management or leadership. But listen, here, yeah. Well, you understand that's one of the elements of the business, and you can attract talent because you got capital and resources, and and scale, and you're scaling, right? You're growing. Yep. But as far as the roofing thing, um, I don't know if it's a, I don't know how it's a good 
mix in HVAC and plumbing. I know some some of the bigger, sophisticated guys are playing in it. I know that. Um, uh, but listen, it comes down to this. Every business needs these three things. Lead generation, lead conversion, client fulfillment. I generate a lead, I close a deal, and I do the work, right? I provide the service. So I think what's really attractive to roofing and HVAC, it's the same. Those three things are basically the same. The lead process is the same. The close is basically the same. And the work, well, not the same. There's air conditioners on a roof, so it's right. Close, right? So <laughs> Some markets, yeah. yeah, yeah that's, some how, markets. that's how we justify it. Um, one thing I like about the roofing space, though, is it's, it's, it's a little bit behind HVAC and plumbing in terms of a, sophistication. A little bit? Well, I don't know. It's a lot of it. It's a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so, but you're spot on. But that's where I see a real big opportunity is that it's nice to say, hey, HVAC and plumbing is actually so far ahead of that. And from what I've seen and experienced, it's so far ahead of that industry, which is great for anybody who's even considering going down that path. And labor is way easier to get way easier to get and train. I don't know about that. Well, because they're using, you know, because they're using subcontractors, there's just more and they use the same set of subcontractors that are coming in. So the point I was trying to get at with it is from a more of a strategic perspective of is that, you know, I see some people and they're doing, coming, putting it together like a good cross-selling opportunity between the two, HVAC and roofing, and then they've got the roofing company. We brought on a customer who is um, in South Florida who's HVAC and roofing to come by and they're one company. So I'm just seeing enough things happening that I'm like, I feel like I made a good decision continuing to chase it down. Um, but since I had you on here, it's like, why not get your two cents on this? I know we, we haven't talked about this since our flight to Louisville. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, I think there's potential in it. I mean, there's guys doing pest control that started on HVAC too. Me personally, I, I look at it like this. If you're not, if you don't own the markets you're in, then work on that Keep first. Keep doing that. Because you know that, right? So that's how I've always played it. Like, uh, like, I'm thinking about how do I make my current process better? Maybe we get into monitoring. So where's a monitoring uh, device that we can get into involved and add to our current offering? How about uh, all this talk about um, subscription services? You know, how do we get in that? There's a big talk about, le- there's a lot of leasing going on in our space. You know, what does that mean and how does that improve my model? So I'm trying to tweak what I got instead of going outside of that. Another thing, though, to that point that, that I, I think is a potential interesting, good, better fit is like EV chargers. Like, oh, yeah. Where, you know, you go on a website, it prices it for you already. You can talk to customer service if you want. You book it right there. You, 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 you own the, the hearts and minds of the nation for EV charging. And uh, you know, with your marketing, and you have subs, and they go put this EV charger stuff in. I, I think that's a good ad for what we do. Yeah, I would agree. And it's for all of the electrical companies that we work with. EV um, actual putting EV chargers in is phenomenal business. Yeah, and it's I'm so big. I know. I know. Yeah, it's different. I'm just millions. saying. Yeah, yeah, made me think of it. You mentioned the leasing. Is that is that really going to catch on? Like, really catch on here in the United States? Obviously, it's huge in Canada. It's starting to get some wheels from what I can see within the influence that I have or I'm, uh, that I'm a part of. What's your two cents on that? Leasing in the U.S. Well, it looks, it looks like it's heading that way. I mean, yeah. traditionally, the challenge was the leasehold improvement laws that kind of slowed it down. But it, it has been around a long time, a lot longer than you think. I mean, I can remember being out in the 90s meeting guys out in um, Washington or Seattle, Seattle area. Uh, that that were leasing water heaters back then in the 90s. So it's not it's not new. Right. It's just not really caught on like it did in Canada. I got to tell you, if you think about anything that we think is new now, if you look at its backstory, everything's 50 years old. <laughs> it takes 50 years to do anything, including Ken Goodrich. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 60. <laughs> Six decades. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We are coming up on our time, KG. Um, 
you know, what's always good about mine, your podcast is that it's just so conversational because you and I are buddies. So this makes, this becomes certainly easy to talk about. We hit on quite a few things. I know we had an agenda we wanted to talk about. The leasing thing really wasn't part of that, but it was interesting to come up because I've had conversations about that. Um, a lot in the fourth quarter, a lot more than normal in the fourth quarter, just different strategic conversations. But, um, and it's exciting for me to watch your journey. And I've only known you for like, you know, past what, two, three years, something like that. we And I've been able to see just a small piece of it, but it's exciting for me to see kind of what you're doing in the industry, how much you're starting to really give back to the industry. I mean, you're at AHR Expo uh, with me sharing live, you know, with everybody else out here on the floor and um, and continuously giving back. And so I appreciate that about you very much. And, um, but, you know, it's, you mentioned getting involved in peer groups. Like I can't encourage the listeners enough to, if you don't know how to do it, just make a post in one of the Facebook groups. Reach out to reach out to me. I'll be able to connect you with the peer group. But even if it's not a peer group, find an accountability partner, something like that. Um, go visit some shops. There's plenty of people that you visit. I think you opened up your shop. You opened up Gettle for anybody that's kind of up here for this this event, right? Um, yeah, we, we have right now 74 people signed up to go visit. That's incredible. Yeah. So, so you, who's But hey, by the way, on, on the map training, you know one of the key things of the map training is that one of the first steps they, they uh, suggest you do to this whole line we're talking about today, get a mentor. Who's your mentor? You got to come back day two and tell us who your, your mentor or sounding board is. Best practice group, whatever. I love it. And you got to do it. Yeah. That's part of the system. That is. Because what you're doing in that best practice group is this foundational thing you keep talking about, educating, educating yourself, learning from others, like on maybe what they're doing differently than you or better. And, mm-hmm. I, and I have to say that I just have to. But I am a member and former board member of ACA, Air Conditioning Contractors America, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the ACA tools that I've had access to over the years have been a big part of our growth and foundation of the company. As well, uh, I've been a member of Service Roundtable since its inception and Service Nation, Nation Alliance. Yeah. So, you know, I, I continue to support those groups and be, be involved in them because I get good, valuable information and good networking. And uh, I will tell you, that's probably how, that's my greatest learning sources is being part of these groups. I think what I appreciate about you too is the fact that it, um, I feel like anytime I've gone to any sort of like conference or something with you, like we went to one before, and, and is how many questions you ask. So I love that you're constantly asking questions, trying to learn things regardless of size or accomplishment. So I think that's kind of an testament to like you are what you are, you know, you are what you say you are, practice what you preach. Um, but that's never going to stop for you. You're gonna constantly going to continue to ask questions. You know, I got I just I got to know. Yep. <clears throat> Sometimes, I mean, it's annoying. It's okay when he's asking me. It's just because usually if you're asking me questions, it's at like 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I'm grateful to have you on again, KG. Um, I'm not sure exactly when this episode's going to roll out, but it's exciting to be doing this live here on the floor at the AHR Expo 2022. Um, our first time participating uh, as a podcast, To The Point Podcast, which, by the way, also a member of ACA, along with Rhino, Strategic Partnership. But it's cool to see it, see everybody here. Um, and to have you here and be able to share your story with everybody uh, on your journey to ghettoizing the nation. So, KG, I appreciate you, brother. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you as well. And uh, you know, thanks for helping me get the message out. And anybody here in the Expo is welcome to come over to Gettle and, and check out what we do. And, and you need to drop off some good ideas for us to improve. There you go. So if anybody wants to go visit Gettle while you're here, Ken Goodrich is right here just waiting to give everybody his cell phone number. He would love for you to text him at all hours of the night. See, get some heads turning. Yep, Ken Goodrich. See you. <laughs> 702-281-5971. Hey, again, I appreciate you so much. And listeners, hopefully you enjoyed another episode with my man Ken Goodrich, Kenny G. Not that, Kenny G. Um, and listen... I would usually read a review. I don't have one since we're live, but I would love for you to leave a review for us, especially um, I like to be able to share that stuff with, if it's about Ken, I'll share it with him too. He loves to hear that as well. 
but continue listening to the podcast. Man, we have, there's a lot of amazing, amazing podcasts here at AHR Expo. I'm excited to meet some of the other hosts, um, some of the guests that are on, and just to kind of be a part of the whole atmosphere. It's fantastic to be back in person with everybody, kind of live, shaking hands, bro hugs, sometimes the uncomfortable two-armed hug that you know you shouldn't go in for. Maybe you should have just done the one hand. Yeah, exactly like that. But it's all fun to be back in hey, person, can you, right? Hey, can you teach me the whole hug, handshake thing? Like, it's... it's it's literally what we do every time. Yeah, but I don't. Like, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with. It. I don't. I'll know show what you. To do. I'll show you right after this is done. I'll do. I'll I'm do not a, a quick, hugger. You well, you are a hugger. You you just, make, it's a little different. I'll show you. All okay. Right, nobody. Right. Nobody cares about and us talking the about shake hugs thing, right now. All the, the shaking thing. I got you. Don't worry. That I got you. Do and, I got it. I got you. Take. Do, right. do, see how much you needed me these past couple of years. Oh, you know, I've been here for you. He's my stylist. That's right. <laughs> I, I your stylist. You've been wearing an orange jacket. <laughs> Not a green jacket. You're off-brand, by the way. All right, so hey, HR Expo, fantastic day here on the podcast floor. You got to make sure that you're checking in. There's a podcast pavilion uh, section over here. There's one on the other side with a lot of a lot of amazing guests here. Check it all out. And to my listeners, to the Point Home Services Podcast family, I love you so much. It's going to be a great 2022. I'm excited and keep listening in. No zero days. Listeners, thank you so much again for listening to this podcast week after week. We are extremely grateful. Again, the whole purpose of this podcast is to give back to the home services industry that we love so much, whether you're a rhino or not. We really, really appreciate all the subscribers. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please go in and subscribe and you'll get all the episodes sent to you automatically weekly. Also, we have really enjoyed your feedback. Uh, it's so meaningful for us when we get to read the nice comments that you guys put. So keep doing that. And if you don't know how to do it, Here's what you got to do. You search for To The Point Home Services on Apple Podcasts. You click on our profile, scroll all the way down to the bottom and hit write a review and be honest and share your story and how the podcast has impacted you and your business. Thanks again from the bottom of our hearts at To The Point Home Services Podcast. We appreciate you.